Greetings everybody and welcome to my three part series on the War Thunder CDK. In this series I'm going to teach you everything I know about War Thunder's mission editor so you can make your own custom battles and missions. In this first part we're going to be learning how to access the CDK and open it. We're going to learn how to load the map and set that to be what you want. We're going to run through all the different tools that are available in the CDK. We're going to learn how to create spawn zones and then finally we're going to learn how to load a mission and play it in game. First off, we need to download the CDK. This page, which will be linked in the description, shows you the download links, and here you can see all the previous versions. But of course, we want the most recent version, which was updated when um, New Power came out on the 2nd of December 2020. So just right, left click that, and it will start downloading. Once this .exe is done, you can open it and run through the installer. Of course my CDK is already downloaded so I can hit cancel. Now it's important to note that when you're installing the CDK you need to install it to your War Thunder folder. When you do it, it will make a War Thunder CDK folder and then once you've got that in your War Thunder directory you know you've installed it correctly. And once it's done you can get opening it. So if you, need, if you ever need some quick access to it usually I just search War Thunder Mission and then you get the War Thunder Mission Editor. You of course can save it to your desktop and have a shortcut or you can pin it to your taskbar. So you see I've got it pinned there. This is what the .exe runs which is called that editor. So when we open it up this is what happens. Now this will you'll be greeted with this start menu and you just want to click OK. It will take a while to boot and ignore this little blue screen. Okay, now we're in the mission editor. By default, the Dover Strait map should launch. I think it's either Dover Strait or Britain, but it's basically the Balonsa Mare map. Now, I should probably stop moving around so you can get familiar with the camera controls. So, you'll be greeted by this. You move around by guiding your mouse across the screen. These red and yellow lines can be completely ignored. They're basically just, they're pointless. Um, in terms of editing, they don't really mean anything as far as I'm aware. Um, so, camera controls. Pretty simple. W makes you go forward. In fact, I'm going to go close to the ground so you can see it. W goes forward. D goes right. A goes left. S goes backwards. Q goes up. E also goes up. Z goes down. And C also goes down. So, W, A, S, D, Q, Z. Now, you can see this is quite slow, so how can you possibly move around the map like this? Well, you press the shift key, you'll go much, much quicker. And then you can move around the map at considerable speed. If you feel like you need to adjust your camera controls, you hit the space bar and you'll exit the camera menu. Now, if you try and press W, A, S and D and whatever, it won't work because now you're, 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 um, you're out of the camera. If you go up to here, to settings and then to cameras, and then to free camera, you can adjust the normal speed, so that's when you're normally moving around, and turbo is when you're pressing shift. So I've currently got mine set to 200 and 5000. Of course you can change that. So, you may be thinking, okay, well this is just a map, but how the hell do I actually start making my mission? Well, you can see up here, you've got this thing called scene view. If you click that, you can see this thing called set level binary dump. This basically sets the map. So whatever map you want to make your mission on, if you left click this, these are the ones that I've all used, but um, when you start the CDK you'll only be given this Britain one. So if you need to access more maps, you press the three dots and that gives you every map in War Thunder right here. And you can load them obviously as necessary. So let's, let's load Saipan. You double click it, you click OK, wait for it to boot, and there you go, there's the Saipan map. There it is. So you can load any map in game. That's how you set the map. Now, obviously, this is just moving around the map, so how do I actually, you know, make a mission? So, here, you've got the mode. Currently, we've got it set to scene view. Scene view basically means not it, it, you're viewing the scene, you're viewing the map, you're not actually doing anything editing wise. Now you might think, okay, well we want to go to the mission editor, and you'd be absolutely right. So if we click that, 
we will then be greeted with this. And you'll see a bunch of toggles and tools and, and options will pop up. Now this is the mission editor. This is where you make uh, your own missions. Okay, so I'm going to guide you through the tools now. To do this, I'm just going to make a quick area so I can demonstrate this to you. I'll go through the areas later, but let's just place a little sphere here. This is called Area 1. Now, from starting from the left, you'll be greeted with the cursor. The cursor just lets you select things, and then obviously you can edit them appropriately. This is the Move tool. So, if you move something, you'll be given three axes. The I think that's the Y. No, it's the Z. And then the X axis. That's the Y axis. So you can either, you'll be given three boxes. If I just go a bit closer to it. You can see that this one, the X and Z, makes it go horizontally across a plane, like that. The Z and the Y will make it go in that direction. It's a bit hard to select because of the way I've got it, but if I move it to that side, we can select that and it, we can make it go across the X and Y, the Z and Y axis. Of course we can do the same with the X and Y axis. So that is how you move an area or whatever you have around. And you can do that like that. Next, we have the move to floor. As you can see, the difference between this and move is that there's no um, Y axis. So when you start moving a unit around like this, it will clip it to the, to the um, zero Y level. So if I move it out to C, it should force it. There we go. See, it's gone down to the to the um, ground level, so you can't see the area anymore. I'm just going to delete that one because I've messed it up a little bit. But that basically makes you clip something to the zero Y level. That's usually the ground, like the very bottom of the ground of the map. Next up, we have rotate. So here you'll be given three axes again. That is your horizontal. This is obviously your yaw and then this is your pitch or whatever you want to interpret it as but you've got three axes to rotate your area in so obviously you can do a full 360 it's a bit hard to get it perfectly right but as you can see you can play around with that and rotate your area accordingly I'm just going to move this area a little bit up like that so you can see it better next up we have resize so here you can see you've been given a triangle this middle triangle makes you, if you pull it out, it makes it smaller. If you pull it in, it makes it bigger. This you need to hold right click for, by the way. That's for all of them. So that changes the size. Of course, you've got three possible other options. So if we go over to here, that will change it in that direction. Distort it in that direction. That one will distort it in that direction. And obviously that one will distort it in that direction. So you can turn any sort of shape into anything you like really with these tools. Finally we have the stick to ground tool. So if I was to make an area up here on this high ground for example, i.e. here, and we move it over so it's floating in this area, see here it's in the air. If we were to use the stick to ground tool, which is this one right here, drop object, it will clip it, it will clip the center point, so this line here, it will clip that to the ground. This is really handy for if you're cloning vehicles, for example, and you are putting them in a line, and you need some, to, you need them all to be stuck to the ground. This is perfect if you just need things to be perfectly clipped to the ground. So that is the drop object tool. So now that we've gone through the brief movement tools, it's important to uh, keep in mind this little kettle thingy here, this teapot. This is the show unit assets. So when you load a mission, this will by default be off. You want to turn it on if you want to show units. So by units I mean if we were to make, I'm just going to run through this later, but if we were to make one of these, you can see that there's meant to be a tank here, except I can't see it because the assets aren't being shown, except if I hit the teapot, suddenly you can see the tank. So if you want to be able to see what you're placing, I recommend keeping this on at all times. Let's get rid of that. Okay. These are some more select tools. This allows you to select only areas, so spheres, cylinders, and cubes. This allows you to select only effects that you can place around, like smoke and fire and whatever. And this obviously lets you select only units. So select areas, 
select effects, select units. And obviously you've got here, select waypoints. We'll run through waypoints um, in another part. Now there's four types of areas, or zones as the CDK likes to call them, that you can make. You can make a point, which is the one on the left, like that. You can make a circle, or a sphere, sorry. And then you can drag it out to be a different size. Drag it out to make it bigger, drag it in to make it smaller, like that. There's another one. You can make a cylinder. And when you do the cylinder or the box, you'll have to draw each axis, in the axis independently. So if we drag it out like that, and then we drag it up like that to make a cylinder. Then you can make, obviously, a box. It will ask you to do one of the axes and then another one like that. Obviously, you can use the resize tool and you can move these around. You can rotate them and then you can resize them to whatever needs you need them to be. So let's say I want this to be longer like that or I want it to be taller, I can do so. So I can manipulate these shapes and change them so accordingly. Now you think, oh, well, what's the point of these shapes? Well, these will come in later, but essentially these are your bread and butter for everything. Usually I just use these two, but I also use this one for stuff like airfields. But you use these to designate spawn areas, you use them to designate cap zones, you use them to designate airfields and bomb bases, everything that you interact with basically is an area, physically at least. So, now that we know the shapes and we've got our kettle on, we can start experimenting around with some of these. Here you've got effects, I don't really use those, but I'm, as far as I'm aware that's things like smoke and fire, but again, they're not very commonly used so you can basically ignore it. This one is create unit. Whenever you want to make something, i.e. a building or a tank or a plane or an airfield or whatever, this is what you go to. Although it looks like a tank, and it will be if you click on it, if we go down to it, it will be a flat Panzer 38T, as you can see. You can obviously go over to this menu here, this drop down, and you can change it to anything you want. So you can armada are planes, object groups are buildings, structures are obviously structures like bridges and railways and whatever, infantry are obviously infantry, tracked vehicles are the air RB models for vehicles, so like the tanks that you see in air games, tank models are obviously the ground tank models, the ones that you see in the tech trees. Ships are obviously ships. Radars, um, I don't really use them because there's only one, but it doesn't really show easily. Air defense are anti-aircraft weaponry. Wheeled vehicles are similar to track vehicles, but that's the obviously wheeled vehicles for air battles. Squad, we'll run through at a later time, but that essentially allows you to group a bunch of units into one group. Area squad, which is the same thing but for areas. And physical objects, which is just debris and stuff like that. So, we'll delete all these and we'll make a plane. So if we go over to Armada and we hit create unit, we can make ourselves a plane. So we've placed it down, let's go over to the move tool, unpress the space bar and look up. And you can see we've got ourselves a handy little A20. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well how do I change this to a different plane or how do I change the name of it? I don't want it to be called Armada underscore zero one, that's a bit dumb. So. This goes for anything like areas or airfields or units or whatever. Zones and units both apply to this. If you want to hit the spacebar, or it doesn't really matter, but I like to keep it fixed while I'm doing this, and you press P while selecting the unit. So I've got it, as you can see, I've got it selected. Here, if I don't have selected, nothing will pop up. But if I have it selected, I press P, I'm greeted by all the object properties. Now, this is a big old menu and it looks quite intimidating at first. But essentially this allows you to change anything of this this unit or whatever it may be. So if I go over to name, I change the name to A20G. As you can see, it's now changed. I can of course change the aircraft type. Now it's an A6M5 Co. And here are all of the aircraft in game. As you can see there's quite a lot of them. There is quite a few. And this you can just change this to any vehicle in game. So we'll set it back to the A20. The way name is essentially something you can ignore for now. Add to squad is what we're going to run through when we do squads. Army is important to know. So in the CDK, you have two teams. You have Army 1 and you have Army 2. In game, Army 1 is Star and Army 2 is Cross. 
So when you go into a custom battle or an arcade battle and you're greeted by Star and Cross, those are armies 1 and 2 respectively. It's important to know that distinction because if you set an A20, for example, to army 2 and then you tell the Germans in your event to go army 2, suddenly they're going to have a friendly A20 on their team which won't make much sense. So make sure you select them to the correct army. These essentially you can ignore. Uh, attack type basically make, basically tells the AI what to do. So you can have fire at will, fire at will to ground, fire at will to air, don't aim which means obviously the guns won't aim, hold fire which means the guns will aim but they won't shoot, attack target which you can designate as a certain target or attack player obviously you can do that, kill target, kill player, essentially these are what they say but I'm not going to run through these. These allow you to customise what the aircraft or whatever the unit can do. So stealth radius, um, stealth doesn't make it invisible, it just means it so the icon above it won't pop up in game, so it won't be spotted easily. Um, obviously you can change that radius to be more than you know a bigger area. Accuracy is obviously the accuracy of its gunners and, and whatever. Um, fuel, obviously if you say it's zero it won't move, um, we'll run through that another time but yeah, that's fuel. Skin. Um, I don't really use skin that much for anything really and obviously you can disable the AI if you don't want it to move at all. Skill is essentially uh, accuracy and delay and stealth kind of com combined together. Targetable by AI is what it says. It is uh, basically if you tick it that says okay this thing is now targetable by other AIs. Speed, obviously you can change the speed to be stupidly ridiculous or whatever but yeah there we go I'll we'll just remove all these. So we'll keep that A20 as it is. Obviously we can make another one. So if we want to make another one, we've got to hit over to create unit. And we can go over there. And we can make another one. We can make this one A109 for example. And we can keep it as army 2 because it's German. And if we go over to BF109. There we go. We have ourselves an enemy 109. That will fight this A20 in game if they both load in. Because they've both got their AI set to fuel. Uh, they're on. They've got gunners on and they want to target each other. Ways and waypoints we'll run through another time because they're quite complicated. But essentially, that is uh, areas and units and loading the editor covered. So next we want to have a look at this thing, which is properties. Now if you close this, suddenly you think, oh crap, how do I get this again? Well this little G with a document over it is your best friend. You're going to want to press this a lot if you get rid of the properties tab. This is your triggers and mission objective information. That will bring it back up. Now it's brought up another tab here called triggers. And we'll run through triggers in a bit. But essentially triggers are what makes your mission your mission. You need these um, for the, obviously for it to work. Usually when I think about the CDK, I like to split it into two parts. So I like to split it in this, into the physical side, i.e. placing units down and messing around with the map. And then the coding side, which is obviously properties and triggers and all that jazz. So we'll run through what each each of what these things mean now. So if you hit mission settings, atmosphere is essentially the pressure and temperature. Um, these will affect engine performance if you change them. Uh, by default, this map is set to 15. Um, colder maps are set to cooler cooler temperatures, obviously, which uh, leads you to get contrails at lower altitude and your engines don't overheat as easily. Um, but I usually don't really mess with this. I leave it as default. Now, player team A and player team B is important to note. Here you can see it's set to the army to either 1 or 2. Usually I just keep A as 1 and B as 2 just for simplistics. And the wings are units that you have to place. So basically what this means is these are allocating player slots. So if I was to make if I was to put a spawn down or whatever and then try and load this mission in game without touching these it wouldn't work because I haven't allocated player slots. Basically, these are allocating the empty player slots. So, if you don't have any of these, then nobody can spawn, not even bots. But if you allocate, obviously, 32 on each team, you can get a maximum of 64 players in the battle. So, you need to set these if you don't want to limit the amount of people that can spawn in. And obviously, if you don't touch it at all, then nobody can spawn in at all. Now, you may think here, oh, I've got to add 32 of these. Oh, this looks so tedious. And trust me, it is. Um... But there's a reference um, file out there that I have uh, from Gentlespeed. I think he got it from somewhere else. But um, 
that basically does all that work for you which avoids all that hassle now if you want to go about doing it yourself it's as simple as creating a unit and just attach attaching that unit so if I was to go over to properties and call it player one it's as simple see it sets to army one so we can attach it to player team A it's as simple as doing that 32 times now there's one more thing to recognize about units if you go over to the move tool and you drag over it or you select it or whatever and you press shift and left click you bring up the clone menu now you can bring up and you can clone as many of these as you like they will all spawn on the same spot but let's say we want 32 players on player team A which is what you want usually unless you want to limit it but I don't see why you want to so let's set to 31 because we've obviously already got one in game you'll see now we've got 32 tanks on this very spot so if I go over to this you can see now we've got 32 players and we're going to add all these one by one here we've got load mission here we've got new mission so if you want to reset oh, I don't want to save changes then this will give you a new mission obviously load mission will allow you to open files and open missions this is save obviously just save save as you're familiar with all these tools run mission um, I usually don't like to run them while I'm in the CDK I prefer to just test them in the game because it, it causes a lot of problems and obviously we're familiar with this okay so we want to open the reference file so we can get our player slots uh, allocated and we can start making a mission so you go over to load mission I personally got it saved on my desktop just as reference we can double click that to open it and you'll see now we're in let's go over to the properties and if we go over to mission settings and we go over to the player slots as you can see they've all been filled magically how convenient now that makes that life a lot easier if we go over to the mission tab this is important because this allows you to name your mission give it a description and we'll run through these so I've just got this set to reference and obviously it's got no description but if you obviously you can set this name to whatever you want and this description to whatever you want that all is what will appear in game so if you go into War Thunder head into custom battles create session and then missions by URL as you can see in the missions by URL I've got all of our battles ready for the Western Front campaign that you can find us over in the description if you're interested um, but essentially these are 10 different missions that I've made and uh, as you can see they've got a name and it's got a description and there's the link but yeah this is the description and you can set this to whatever you want let's go back into the CDK okay so now we're back in the CDK and we've got this now type is an important thing to recognize personally I just use event because it saves a lot of things from breaking and if you if you use the others then it tends to sort of blinker your file and force it down a particular avenue where it blocks a lot of different things that you're able to do uh, but event just allows you to do everything so I always set it as event but obviously you can set it as tournament uh, or domination or test flight if you want to obviously uh, mess around with those specific things the level is the map so um, wh when you were in the scene view and you were setting the uh, level binary dump this is just the name of the map so here we're on Saipan so we want to click Saipan.bin so now it's the correct map game type params I usually just always set them to capture because um, I, I like capture zones on my uh, battles um, but obviously if you don't have any caps then obviously you can just set it to tickets now here you've got some other ones that you can use like race and football last man standing deathmatch explosives which you can use um, to reload or to reload yourself um, that's a trigger that you have to set up though but yeah obviously you've got some other options that you can use here um, but I just like to use capture as again it's kind of an all-encompassing thing that allows you to um, make whatever you want now the common params uh, are stuff like the options that you find in game like oh should we limit fuel should we limit ammo um, I don't really I, I tend to ignore this one so don't really care about that but again I don't really touch these in case I want to change them in game uh, this will hard limit them to a certain option so if you turn on if you turn on limited fuel then you won't be able to turn it off again if you try and load it in game so I tend generally just try to not touch these now the versus parameters are things like this um, now the score limit I always set it to just a random number um, I wouldn't set, recommend setting it as high as possible because that tends to break things but um, I don't know why I choose 20, 29,000 but it's just what I do uh, and that tends to work just fine 
Now, death penalty mole um, is essentially how many tickets uh, will the team lose if somebody dies. Now, because there's multiple respawns and lots of people die in our events, I like to set that to zero because obviously I don't want the game to end just because people kept dying. I want the game to end because the objectives have been completed or whatever. So I always set that to zero. Obviously, you can do these for different things like bots allowed, use tank bots, all these different options, but all I tend to use are score limit, death penalty mole, and allow MT teams. Let's close that up. Don't need to mess with any of these because we're not doing race or football or single player. Um, you can allow winch and you can do other things like this if you want people to tow. Um, and again, I tend to just leave these as is. Weather parameters, obviously you can then come in here and this allows you to mess around with the weather and customise it to whatever you see fit. So at the moment we've just got it set to day and clear, but we can change it to different times of the day, i.e. Um, 5pm. 5, 5 we can change the weather to any of these options and obviously do that as necessary. Jesus, that's bad. We'll keep it as day and clear though. Now, um, you've got other options here like custom weather that you can mess around with. Um, I only tend to do this if, I, if the weather is properly important to the battle, but usually a mix of these times and options is good enough. But obviously you can mess around with them here. And you've just got to kind of play around with them to understand and get a feel of how it is. So if we close all this up, we can get going. So that's the mission settings. Now we're going to have a look at triggers. So as I said earlier, triggers are your coding bread and butter. Just as much as areas are your physical bread and butter, the triggers are what you use to actually make the mission come to life. So if we want to make a spawn zone, i.e. let's just add a spawn. So let's make a, um, a circle or a sphere. Let's put it here. Let's go over to the object properties by pressing P and let's call it Team 1 Spawn. We can close that back up because we don't need to touch it again. Now, obviously we've now got an area. So, over in the triggers, we can go over to add a new trigger by pressing Trigger. And you can see here it brings up a menu and it make, finally this window starts getting some use. So we can call this trigger anything we want, but I'm just going to call it Starting Spawns. Now, the events, um, essentially I'll run through these now. So, if you go over to event, you can change the type of event. So, periodic event um, is essentially a time delay. So, um, you can set a custom time delay. So, this trigger will only activate after a certain time in-game. Usually, I don't like to use periodic event because it just makes things messy. And it, um, in terms of an event setting, it makes people rely on um, starting at a certain time. Um, or completing something by a certain time or completely on time you know so it changes over right I just tend not to mess with them I tend to like it so the battle changes when, whenever people finish it not just when a certain time is reached time expires obviously this that means the trigger will be activated until a certain time uh, it's essentially the opposite of periodic event and init mission means initialized um, at mission so that basically means from the start so when it loads uh, when the mission loads and the game starts, um, that is basically that. So it'll start that. So we want our spawns to be in it mission because we want them to be active for the whole game. We don't want it to be turned off in a certain time. Now, um, that's the event set. So if we go over to action, this allows you to set the action. Now, all here are different types of things that you can do. But there are essentially maybe five or six that I use regularly. Add airfield. Um, mission markers respawn point, mission markers capture zone, mission markers waypoint, um, mission set bombing area, which is the bombing base, um, mission set time speed, which allows you to change the speed of the game. Um, yeah, I essentially just use those four or five. But for this, obviously, we want a respawn point, so mission markers respawn point. Okay, now that we've got our trigger set, we can go over to this area and we can start looking at the action. So you can see it is a mission marker's respawn point. Now we need to set a target so it needs to know which spawn or which area is going to be the spawn. So if we go over to target, uh, you've got all of the player slots here as you see. And team A, the team B, these are the squads. But here we want our team 1 spawn. So we go over here. There we go. Team 1 spawn. Here we give it a name. You need a name. Um, but essentially this is what, you, what the spawn will be called in game. It's important to note that you won't see the names of the areas in game you'll see the local name. So 
Just because we've got this named as Team 1 Spawn doesn't mean that it will be called that, that in game. We need to write it in here. Um, so that's what the people will read in game. Um, usually I don't like to mess with any of these. Um, spawn effect, add some fire around the spawn. Is strict spawn. Um, obviously it says there, players will be able to respawn on areas in order in which they are listed in squad. Um, yeah, I tend not to mess with that because it makes it so you can only join that spawn if you're a certain squad. Which, eh, it's nice but it's also pretty complicated and you generally tell people where to spawn anyway. Is airfield is used for spawns on an airfield obviously. Um, but show on map allows you to see the spawn flag in game. Now we need to add a few more things here before we're done. We need to set a team, so we want to set it to A because it's team one. Um, we want to set some tags. So tags you'll use all the time. Tags are basically what type of vehicle can spawn or do something here. What type of vehicle can interact with this trigger. So here obviously we, it's a ground spawn so we want tanks. So we need to press that and we need to click tank. Um, obviously you can limit it to certain types of tanks but generally that, that tends to mess with things. So I just tend to set it to tank. Obviously, you can limit the countries, the ship type, the you know static artillery type, planes, hydroplanes. If it's a carrier takeoff, you can mess around with all of that. That is essentially our spawn finished. So, I'll add another one for Team 2. So, Team 2 can actually get some spawns in as well. So, we can right click and uh, clone it. It's team 2 spawn. Move that over there. Move it down into that little dip. Copy this, paste it, because we want it to be the same. Team 2 spawn, change it to Team B, and then change that area to Team 2. And that's the Team Spawn 2. Now, just another thing to note, the red line, that I believe that's the x-axis, if we... Yes, the x-axis, is where you, what direction you'll be facing when you spawn in. So, obviously if we rotate it, currently, um, if you spawn in here at Team 1, you'll be facing that way. Now, I'd like to face it the other spawn, and then we can check, put that there. So now they're facing each other if you look. And you can mess around with that appropriately. So, we've hit the space where again, we're moving around, um, and that's our mission ready to go, basically. So, save as, because I don't want to save it as the reference, because I don't want to overwrite it. Um, CDK Tutorial Part 1. So now that we've saved the mission, we have to upload it to some sort of third-party medium so we can actually get a link for it and load it in-game. Now personally, I just tend to use Discord as it's convenient and easy, but you can upload it to things like Google Drive, Dropbox, OneDrive, um, YouTube I think also works, uh, and obviously the War Thunder Live page works and you can copy the mission link that way. But yeah, I just tend to use Discord as it tends to be the quickest and easiest. So here we're in Discord and I'm just going to get the mission link and upload it. So it's a .blk file. All mission um, files in War Thunder are .blks. So now that we've got that copied, uh, sorry, sent, uh, we go over to the hyperlink and we right click and we press copy link. And then we go over to a text channel or whatever, paste it, by pressing control V. And here we go over to the HTTPS and remove the S. So it's HTTP. Now if we copy that again, we can delete it because it's copied. If we go over to into War, if we go over into War Thunder, um, and if we get back into the hangar, so here's the hangar. If we go over to into custom battles, create session because you want to make a new session. Um, you don't want one of the default missions that Guardian gives you because you've just made your own. You want a mission by URL, and here you want to press add mission. So add it, put the URL in, and call it whatever you need to call it. Now this this little button here will allow you to download it. There we go. And now we can start mission. I'll set it to arcade, I'll set a password, include some bots, and we can get started. As you can see, because we've allowed a tank slot to spawn, tanks are allowed to spawn because they're highlighted, but planes can't spawn because obviously we haven't set a plane spawn. So as you can see, we're now on the Saipan map, and you can look in and you can see these two spawns that we've placed. And here we are. We're in game and we're in the map. As you can see, because we've allocated some bot slots, these bots are able to spawn as well. So that's the basics done for a mission in War Thunder. You now know how to load the editor, set your map, you know how to make areas and units, you know how to make a spawn area and you can start making triggers, you know how to save it and you know how to load it in game. 
So now you can get making a very basic mission. And in part 2 we're going to go through some more complicated things like more triggers, conditions, caps, airfields and bases. So if you like this video make sure to like and subscribe and make sure to watch part 2 if you're interested in learning a bit more. I've been Reno and I'll see you next time.